Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to MOB 310. My name is Blaise Pele. I'm an enterprise support lead at AWS. I'm originally from Cameroon. I've been working at AWS for about three years in our enterprise support organization with other technical account managers, and we help enterprise customers operate well on top of AWS. And uh, my name is Ed Lima. I'm, I'm uh, based in Australia. I'm a solutions architect. Uh, very exciting to be here, just a little bit jet lagged. Uh, so I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, and actually last week's been kind of a hard week for us, right? Because me and Brice were friends and uh, been working together in this project for, for a while. Uh, but they decided to hold a soccer match between the, our two national teams. And our, our countries are soccer fanatic countries, right? And uh, so it's been a tough week for one of us uh, because the other one has been bragging a lot. <laughs> but you know what? Let's, uh, let's not talk about that anymore. Let's, let's forget about that. Um, so thank you for joining us today. This session is all about looking into how to build modern web applications. And specifically, what we want to talk about is how we can bridge the gap between real-time and offline features and AI and ML capabilities. So to look into that, what we first want to do is talk about the challenges that mobile and web applications face in 2018. Then we want to look at how to address some of the difficult basics that are required for these applications we want to look at how we can solve these challenges, and then we want to look at how we can boost our applications with intelligence. So I talk about the challenges that developers face. So what are those challenges? Well, when we do development for applications, there's a couple of things that we always need to handle that happen over and over again. First of all, today's application should be built for anybody and for everyone. And by that, I mean that applications should be able to recognize users via authentication and grant those users access to specific resources based on authorization. Oftentimes, authentication and authorization are the first things that your users interact with on your application. Think about users signing in, signing up, or granting access to the right APIs, signing your APIs. So getting it right is important. But getting it right means having a specific understanding of security protocols, security best practices, and user management. This is a skill set that most front-end developers do not have, so implementing this is not easy. Applications should be available anywhere on any type of network. So your application should provide the best experience on a slow network, slow connectivity, or fast connectivity. For example, my application should work well whether I'm connected to an LTE advanced network in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip or connected to a slow Wi-Fi connection in the basement of a fancy Las Vegas hotel. I need to provide the same experience. So for that, we need to design with network utilization in mind, and our applications need to be network friendly. Applications need to be able to run on anything. So here we're talking about any type of device. The challenge here is that there exists a multiple, multitude of devices with various form factors that we need to account for. The problem is that we don't really have the luxury of designing specifically for all these different form factors and platforms and um, operating systems. So we need to be able to handle that. Then applications should make data available in an instant. Here I'm talking about real-time inline notification and updates. So it's 2018, and we all know that as users, we've grown fairly impatient with the way we interact with our applications. We want applications to be snappy. We want data available right away. How do we actually make that happen? It's critical for our users if we want to provide the best user experience, but how do we make that happen? We not only have to look at the requirements on the front-end application and what that means for an application in a device, we also need to look at the back-end requirements to make this happen. Then last but not least, applications should be available at any time. Okay, it's great if we can make our application work on a slow connection, that's great. But applications should also be usable, useful, when we are offline. And your users should feel confident 
that the work that they do on their, your application while they are offline will be successfully synced when the application comes back online. And any challenges, any conflicts that happened while the application was offline will be resolved into cloud. And if we look at where things stand today, looking at most applications and what developers do today, these challenges are still hard to solve. And when you really think about it, solving these challenges should be the basic requirement for any application. But we can't just stop there, because yes, solving the challenges will, make, will improve the security of your application, the usability, and the quality. But at the end of the day, solving these challenges will not really make your application stand apart. There are millions of applications that exist on uh, multiple application stores. You also have to ask yourself, how do you differentiate your application from all the other applications that are out there? So developers also need to address the differentiation challenge. And to do this, they need to be uh, uh, able to iterate quickly. So developers should be able to implement the basics that we talked about quickly at a fast clip, at a low cost of implementation, and really move on to focus on what makes their applications great. They need to focus on development and not on servers, right? We're building front-end applications. We want to focus on what we do best, which is development, and not ma uh, managing infrastructure. And to differentiate the applications, we need to find innovators way, innovative ways for users to interact with the applications. We want to make our applications smarter, and that's a real challenge. We don't want to have to go and get a PhD in data sciences just to, imp to add some intelligence to our application. So in short, mobile web apps today must solve the security challenge by starting to look at off end and off Z by default. We need to solve the data challenge, make sure that our calls are network friendly, make sure that data is instantaneous with real-time feedback. We need to solve the screen and mobility challenge, make our app responsive, progressive, available, even offline. And we need to solve the differentiation challenge. How can we make applications stand out? How can we differentiate them from the multitude of applications that exist out there? And at the end of the day, we don't want to have to deal with servers. This only slows us down. So then we can ask yourself, what does an application that actually solves these challenges look like? Well, we actually implemented a messaging application that addresses some of those challenges. And here's a high-level overview of what this application looks like. Before we dig into the architecture, let's actually walk through a demo of an application that implements and solves some of those challenges. So, switch my view here, jump into this demo. We have an application, as when we launch our application, the first thing that we're greeted with is a sign into your account screen. So we wanna make sure that our application is secure, we want our users to authenticate. So, I have a user here called John Doe, make sure you can log in. And this is also a progressive web app, so as you can see on my mobile phone here, it looks and behaves like a normal mobile app. I open it, I'm already logged in, and I can access the screen. We need to update the view. Okay, let me, uh, let's refresh this here. It's not showing up. Okay, let's. Uh, Demo gods. Little, little glitch. Always present. We, let's try again. Awesome. There you go. Yeah, so this is the app, and I have access to. So this is our application. We're running it. We implemented this one once, and it's running on multiple devices, different form factors. So I can open this chat. It's a chat application like WhatsApp, chat applications that you've seen. It's very simple. I can send a message to uh, Ed here. And as you can see, on this side of the screen, instantaneously, the application is made available. So this is real-time updates and notifications. Same thing happens when Ed sends me a message. Now, we want our application to be um, network friendly. So when we load conversations, a conversation and we load the messages in this app, we do a batch request for a certain number of messages, but we don't want to have to fetch all of the messages for, the, for this application. 
So that helps us save on network um, connectivity. However, we have a long, Ed and I talked throughout the day, so we have a lot of messages. We can easily scroll back in our history of messages and fetch more messages as needed. So this helps us really um, make sure we have tight control of how we interact with our backend and make sure we get data when, when we need it. I can also simply upload an image here. Good to be in Vegas. Send it over the wire. Even on this Wi-Fi network, it's pretty fast. And Ed automatically receives it on his side of the connection. I can easily search for messages as well. Uh, so I just wrote, good to be here in Vegas. You can see here. I have another chat with myself. I can switch to here. And I can easily go back to the chat that I have with Ed. OK, but what happens in times when we don't have any connectivity? So let's see how this works. What I'm going to do here is I have the developer tools here open in Chrome. And I'm going to take my application offline. So I'm offline at this point. I'm going to try to send a message. And as you can see, there's nothing going on on the network view here. Ed hasn't received a message. Um, but the message is still showing up on my screen. If I try to zoom in here, you can see that when I first sent this message, we have a check mark here. That's a visual cue that shows the check mark is green. It shows that the message was actually sent and received. On this side here, we have this message that was uh, typed in and sent when the application is offline. And we have a view, visual cue that shows us that the message has not been sent. So what happens when we go back offline, online? When I go back online, I don't want to have to retype my message. I want my application to take, take care of conflict resolution and syncing automatically. So I'm just going to click here, go back online. And you see that immediately there's a GraphQL request that's send out, sent out. And Ed gets my message. He's able to type back, I'm still here. So I got the instantaneous feedback. I got the offline um, usability. So this application is implemented uh, and was implementing really quickly using uh, AWS AppSync. This is the AWS AppSync console if you're not familiar with it. We'll give you a quick overview of what the console looks like. You can go in here and find the full schema that was used to implement this um, application. You can look at the content of the schema. It's a pretty large schema, and we'll talk about how we implemented this. Um, you can look at all the resolvers that are associated with it. You can look at the data sources. So we have multiple data sources that we're using tr throughout the application. We have Lambda data sources, a lot of Dynamo data sources, and we also have Elasticsearch. This is what we're using um, to search. I can jump into my message table real quick. And into items, can see all of the messages that were sent. And this is where we're storing our data. Um, in the AppSync console, you can also easily interact with data um, directly. Let's say you're in the middle of the development cycle and you need to uh, test your queries. You can come to this query uh, editor here. You can log in using the same credentials that you use to log in to your application. And that gives you access um, to, to the API. You can send queries, execute um, mutations. So let's take a look at some additional features that we implemented here. Uh, so we, uh, this is a great chat app, right? Because you can send messages, but uh, that's all chat apps, they do that. So how can I differentiate and add some more features, interesting fe features at that? So let's start with uh, chatbots. I'm a big fan of Chuck Norris, who doesn't like Chuck. So I created a bot that's called Chuckbot. And I can ask him to give me a Chuck Norris fact. So it opens a little UI here, and I can ask different facts, for instance, about uh, developers. Chuck Norris protocol design method has no status, requests or responses, only comments. 
Okay. Sometimes we have some bad jokes, but. Uh, it's believed dinosaurs are extinct due to, due to a giant meteor. The truth is, if you want to call Chuck Norris a giant meteor, yeah. We also have a, a second chat bot here that I can interact by uh, asking for uh, movie details. So uh, tell me about a movie. So I have those conversational interfaces where I'm uh, receiving, sorry, but that's not, I forgot to type the correct name of the bot. So I have a conversational interface, so it's asking me what the, the movie name. Uh, one of my favorite movies was Pulp Fiction. So and then I can get the details on Pulp Fiction, can go to IMDb. Uh, for some reason we have it duplicated here, but it's a little bug. Um, what else? You can also translate messages. Uh, I'm sending a message in Portuguese here to, to please. I don't understand Portuguese. Yeah. But I can translate to, uh, for instance, French. He speaks French. Uh, and I can actually speak that Désolé, message. Désolé, j'ai gagné au football. But I can also translate back to English. Uh, and I can also speak. Sorry, I won at football. Yeah. I can speak the message, uh, I can translate different messages, I can also uh, perform sentiment analysis. For instance, uh, imagine that you are, this is the day after the replay party, right? So, so I think lots of people are gonna be in that state after the party, and I can basically run sentiment analysis. I love this face, it just, it looks hangover. And the text entities as Vegas. Uh, you can also uh, uh, perform image recognition. So uh, please, could you take a picture of the folks? Maybe there's yeah. a celebrity here. Yeah, let's see if there's a celebrity in this, in this room. It's kind of dark, but. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, it, it just is frozen again. So it, he sent the picture, let me just uh, open up. So you can see the picture here. Uh, it can detect crowd, person, audience, indoors, but apparently there's no celebrities. Uh, okay. But let's see a, a picture of celebrities then, with lots of them. So you know, I, I'm a uh, movie buff, I love movies, and sometimes I just want to find out who, uh, who is in a movie or in a picture. So here again, I'm detecting, uh, detecting celebrities here. As you can see, Jared Leto, Ella DeGeneres detects all of them, and also the labels, so I can have image detection built in on the app. Uh, now let's, let's test offline. So what happens when I go offline with my AI capabilities, right? So again, I'm going offline here, uh, as you can see. But uh, if I click, as you can see, it's immediately uh, uh, displayed because this is all cached locally. So I have uh, offline access to my insights. I have offline access to my chatbot and um, to my translations here. So if I go to French, they're all cached locally. I'm, again, I'm offline and I can basically go through my sentiment analysis. So it's all available offline. I can go back online and start sending messages again. And Brice receives a message on the device. Awesome. So this is just an overview of what we can implement um, with offline capability, with real-time features, and by implementing some AI ML services.
So first of all, here's a link to the GitHub repo where we uh, posted the link, uh, the, um, the source code to the application that we just went through, and we'll have a QR code at the end uh, as well if, you, if that's easier for, for the folks in the audience. But let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure that we have here. So we have an application running on a mobile device or on our, on, on our laptop. We used Amazon Cognito uh, for authentication and authorization. And then we used AWS AppSync as a facade towards all of our services. We're using multiple data stores. As I mentioned, we're using DynamoDB, Elasticsearch, and AWS Lambda. We're also using Amazon S3 to store our artifacts. So you saw that we were uploading uh, images to, the, to, the, to our application, they're stored in S3. Our AWS Lambda resolver actually helps us interact directly with our AI ML services. We use things such as Poly and Lex and Comprehend. And those services also have access to the data that we store in our S3 bucket. So you saw that we uploaded a file independently of the AI service, and then we were able to point the service to the bucket to do analysis on that. So this is pretty powerful. So let's dive into the situation and talk a little bit about how we can implement some of these basics that we talked about, things that we should have in all the applications. So we talked about the fact that developers need to be able to iterate quickly. And for that, you need to write toolchain, toolchain and CLI. Well, the AWS Amplify CLI makes it really easy to get started with front-end development. Whether you are starting an Angular project, React, React Native, or Vue project, it is the tool chain to use. It makes it a breeze to deploy and manage resources in your AWS account. And you can get started with it by simply doing this npm install AWS Amplify slash CLI. AWS also provides the Amplify SDK. The Amplify SDK makes it really easy for your application to interact with those resources that you deployed in your AWS account. It supports multiple categories of functions, for example, database, API, Lambda function, authentication, and others, and we are continuously updating it with new capabilities. So it's the toolkit to use if you want to, deploy, to implement quickly. The first thing we need to do, though, for our app is solve the security challenge. As I mentioned, identity is mission critical for application. This is your first step into securing your application. It's not something that we can really compromise. And there are three key areas that we need to address. Authentication, to make sure we recognize our users. Authorization, to grant the right access. But we also need to think about user management. And implementing all this means that we have to think about a couple of things if we wanted to implement it. First of all, I talked about the security protocols, right? You've got to stay up to date with protocols and understand how to, understand how to implement them and keep them up to date. But you also have to think about the user management. And a lot of the time, that means implementing the right infrastructure, right? making sure that your infrastructure scales, thinking about things like cost, making sure that this is uh, optimally uh, cost optimized. These are hard things to do. And if you're going to tackle these things first on, you're gonna spend a lot of cycles there. Implementing infrastructure is hard. It's not something that we wanna do, but we need to make sure that our applications are always secure. So developers can use services like Amazon Cognito, along with the AWS Ampl Amplify CLI, to quickly deploy Cognito resources into cloud, authenticate against a Cognito user pool, and then use JWT tokens or AWS credentials to access your APIs. This is built with best security practices, and it's really easy to get started. In my terminal, if I was developing this application, all I would have to do is call amplify add off, then follow the prompts to define a Cognito user pool or Cognito resources uh, in my backend. Then I can execute an Amplify, at, Amplify push or Amplify off push if I only want to push the off, which will deploy those resources uh, on my behalf. When the resources are done deploying, the AWS Amplify CLI returns an AWS exports file. The AWS exports file contains the configuration information about your backend resources. And you can use that file to configure to Amplify SDK in your application. So this is what we're doing here. We import the AWS export as AWS mobile, we import the Amplify um, library and the off library. And then we, we import this with Authenticator. It's a higher order component from the AWS Amplify React library. I configure to Amplify with my settings. And from then on, I can actually interact with my off sessions. So when the comp component is mounted in this React app, 
I can actually get information about my session by simply calling off current session. This is pretty powerful. It takes care of a lot of underlying work that needs to be done for you to correctly get information about your session. I can then use the with Authenticator higher order component to wrap my application. As you saw in the demo, the first thing that you saw when you launched the app is a sign-in screen. We did not implement that. This is given to us by the Authenticator. They are pre-built UI components that follow best practices that you can use in your app directly. And you can also customize them using various style sheets. To solve the data challenge, we use GraphQL. If you're not familiar with GraphQL, GraphQL is a query API, query language for your API. So the cool thing about GraphQL is that it is not restricted or associated with a single data source, but it makes available a single endpoint that developers can interact with to access multiple data sources. To understand how GraphQL works, think about if you had built an application for a blog. And let's say you wanted to retrieve information about posts, comments, and authors. The way you would typically do it in a REST, with a REST API is you would first make a query to posts. You would get the, post ID, the IDs for the posts, and then you would retrieve the comments for all those, um, all those posts using the post ID. You would then retrieve the author information uh, in a similar fashion. So you would make three different API calls to your backend. And you don't have great control over the information that is returned. With GraphQL, I actually don't need to do that. I can make a single call to my backend using GraphQL and get the data that I want. I can use a selection set to specifically, to um, explicitly specify the information that I want returned. So I can get my post comments and authors, but I can spe specify the fields that I want returned. This allows me to make, um, optimize, to optimize my uh, networking utilization and my request. But typically when you talk about using GraphQL, that also means having to implement a GraphQL server. And as we said at the beginning of the presentation, we don't want to have to deal with servers. This is where AWS AppSync comes in. AWS AppSync is a fully managed serverless GraphQL service that you can launch to make use of GraphQL capabilities. It allows you to connect data to data sources in your account. As we saw in the demo, you can connect to multiple data sources using a single endpoint. And it implements functionalities such as data sync, real-time and offline features. The cool thing about GraphQL is you can really use it as a facade to access any service in your account. It really lets you interact with all of the services and data sources that you have in your account. It provides conflict detection and resolution into cloud. And least but, uh, last but not least, it is imp implemented using enterprise security best practices and features so you can use GraphQL with confidence. AWS AppSync and GraphQL with confidence. Taking a closer look at how we built our serverless messaging application with NoSQL, we used DynamoDB as our primary data store. And we have multiple types with different access patterns that we're st storing in multiple tables. But there's also relationship that exists between those types. Using DynamoDB and AppSync, we were able to create relationship between those, those tables. For example, our conversations, we have multiple conversations in the app, we were able to quickly represent the fact that conversations have a one-to-end relationship with messages. So a conversation can be linked to multiple messages. And we were able to represent the fact that multiple users can have multiple conversation and vice versa. So we were able to represent an end-to-end -end relationship via a user conversation table. This is also pretty powerful. Now to get started with uh, GraphQL, you need to use a schema to define your types and to define relationships between your types. The thing is that writing a schema, writing resolvers, and linking them to data sources can be pretty time consuming. But the Amplify CLI helps here. You can use the Amplify CLI to create a minimal schema that can be compiled into a full-blown GraphQL schema that is then linked to data sources into your account automatically and deployed as an AppSync API. Also really easy to get started. In my terminal, if I were to do this, I would simply call Amplify Add API, and I would follow the prompt to create a GraphQL endpoint. Here, for example, I create a conversation type, but I, annot I annotate the conversation type with a model directive. 
What this does is that it defines my conversation type as a type that is backed by a DynamoDB table. You can also see that I create a relationship between my messages. There is a connection between conversation and messages. I do the same thing for my message type. I annotate it with the model directive, but I also annotate it with the searchable directive. So not only is my message type backed by a DynamoDB table, it also defines it as a type that needs to be synced with an Amazon Elasticsearch uh, domain. So any change that I make to my messages are not only saved to DynamoDB, but they are also streamed to my Elasticsearch domain. I can use the Amplify API GQL compile command to make sure that my minimal schema is actually valid and compiles to a full-blown schema. I can then push this to, the, to my AWS account using Amplify API push. This will deploy all of the resources necessary, AWS AppSync, DynamoDB table, and Elasticsearch um, for this uh, minimal schema. It will also take care of defining the DynamoDB streams and the Lambda functions required to stream all of the information from my DynamoDB table to my Elasticsearch um, domain. And to this point, I have done this without writing a single piece of code for my backend. Pretty powerful. And all of this is made possible via transformers. So transformers in, with the Amplify CLI are responsible for defining directives and responsible for specifying how those directives map to resources in your account when you do a push. The cool thing about it is that the Amplify CLI can actually be extended with custom directives, with custom di transformers that can, uh, that can create custom directives. So here, for example, this is just an example, but we created a custom directive that we can, that we can use to annotate a field. And in this field, I create a custom directive and I say, I wanna have a, get a subscription for this field and I want this subscription to be triggered based on a message conversation ID. And this would automatically create a subscription with all of the resources needed to make it work. So transformers are pretty powerful. And with AWS AppSync, we can mix and match data sources. So we talked about the fact that our message is not only backed up by DynamoDB ta a DynamoDB table, but it's also searchable via Elasticsearch. So using my singular endpoint, I can send all of my queries to AWS AppSync, and if I need to list messages or to create messages, this is done through DynamoDB. So my basic CRUD operations are done against DynamoDB. But anytime I make a mutation, let's say, that, does, that creates a message and that updates a message, I then have my DynamoDB stream and my Lambda function that automatically uh, replicates that information into Elasticsearch. So when I do a query that is made for search, that is intended for search, my search messages is actually routed to my Elasticsearch domain. This is pretty powerful. I wanna do CRUD against DynamoDB, but if you're familiar with DynamoDB, it is not the best resource to use for searches. If I wanna do regex searches, I'd rather use Elasticsearch. Again, not a single line of code written for my backend at this point. Let's take a look our, at our application. How did we actually design this? Well, we have multiple components that make up the application, and we decided to split the data presentation into multiple components. So you can see here we have a messenger component, input bar, message pane, conversation bar, user bar, sidebar. When we started doing this design, we really focused on the UI, the user interface. None of the components that we have here are responsible for actually fetching data. They are responsible for displaying and rendering data. The way we handle actually fetching data from our backend is by using this GraphQL function that is made available by the Apollo React library. The GraphQL function defines a higher order component that we can use to wrap our actual components. The way it works is that when I call GraphQL and I pass it to search, which is actually a query, this will return a component that when mounted, mounted will automatically execute a search. I can provide some options that defines how to define my variable based on the props associated with the component, and I can also define a skip property that, uh, that defines when a search should be skipped. So in our example, the search result list component, as the name implies, is responsible for displaying search results. Right, that's all it does. And it um, gets the data from the search, res search result list with data, but if there's no term that was entered into search bar, we don't wanna have to search for anything, so we skip the search. And anytime we update the, uh, the term that's into search bar, we do another query. 
So this is pretty cool. The term comes from the search bar, and to make sure that we don't trigger a search on every keystroke, we use a debounce function to make sure that there's a, a bit of delay and spacing between the searches. So this is how we make data available to our components. Now, to make the data available, we do need to configure our apps, AWS AppSync um, client. And we do that, again, using AWS Amplify. There are four easy steps that you need to follow anytime you want to write an application like this. First, you want to import the modules that are required. You, we want to import our AWS AppSync client. The client is what is doing most of the work here. You want to import your setting from AWS exports. I talked about this previously. Second, you want to actually configure the client. So we use the uh, information, configuration information that we get from AWS exports to specify the URL, the region, and the authentication type. In our, in our application, we want to use Cognito user pool to authenticate, and we use JWT tokens for uh, authentication. As you can see here, we're using an async await pattern, and this makes sure that um, because logging in is an asynchronous process, this makes sure that the session, we wait for the session to be available before getting to ID token and before configuring our application. The third thing you want to do is um, define the advanced settings. So we saw, you saw that in our application, we actually upload images to S3. This is tightly coupled with, with AppSync, so it, 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 the, the action is actually linked. And to do this, we define complex data handling. So we define complex object credentials to store information in S3. We can't use JWT tokens. Um, we need to use actual credentials. But we can get those credentials easily by simply calling off current credentials. And then if you need to use um, complex uh, advanced settings like unions and interfaces, you also can uh, specify your cache options. Lastly, we wrap our application into higher order components. The first thing we do is that we make the client available to the Apollo provider. Um, this is using the provider consumer pattern, so this ensures that any consumer within the component tree actually has access to the client, so that you don't have to pass the client down as a prop. We then load the app um, data, we rehydrate our application data from storage, we launch the application when it's ready, and last but not least, we use the with authenticator to make sure that authentic authentication is required. To make sure that our application is network friendly, we use batch requests. This is what you saw. Everything, every time we load a conversation, we mount a conversation or we switch a conversation, we want, to batch, we want to batch request a number of messages. This is easily done again. In our messenger component, we wrap that in a higher order component. And any time we load a new conversation, we're simply going to fetch a new message. As you can see here, the main variable that we're using is a conversation ID. So anytime the props changes, we load this, uh, this new set of messages. And then when we scroll back, we can use a fetch more function that is made available by the client to fetch additional messages. Because we're using DynamoDB, we can use a next token that is, returned, that is returned to us every time we make a query. And the next token actually points out to DynamoDB where the next set of messages should be retrieved from. We also want to make the application instantaneous. And for that, we're using subscriptions. So subscriptions are, are pretty handy. Um, we can use subscription to get information automatically pushed to our application. This is pretty good because we don't have to do any type of polling whatsoever. If you've ever had to implement instantaneous behavior in your application using polling with a large fleet of clients, you know that this can be pretty taxing to your back end. And if you've ever had to deal with um, 3G, 4G, LTE type of networks, you know that the constant polling is not something that we want to happen over the network. So subscriptions, they are granular, so we can specify exactly what we want and only get the data that we want. They're real time and they happen when the application is being used. So we, we call that inline notifications. In our application, this is also pretty good, uh, easy to do. The message pane component is rendered by the messenger component. And any time we mount that component, we are actually going to initiate uh, a subscription by using the subscribe to more function. We pass the document on create message that is actually a subscription definition, and we specify the uh, conversation ID. So we only want to get messages, new messages for the specific conversation. And when, convers when conversations are returned, we can use the update query uh, function to update our list of messages. The imp one important thing to do is that when you unmount 
your component or when you switch conversations, you want to make sure that you unsus unsubscribe. Uh, this is really important because you cannot have two same subscriptions running at the same time in your application. You can have multiple subscriptions, but I cannot have two subscription for the onCreate message running at the same time. How does subscription work? In our React application, subscriptions are implementing using WebSocket. So my application sends a subscription query to AppSync, which in turn returns a WebSocket URL, and that URL is then used to establish a secure connection to which subscriptions are pushed in real time. I like the fact that we don't have to implement this. To solve the screen challenge, we made our application responsive. Using a responsive design allows us to write once and run anywhere. As you saw during the demo, we had the same application running on the laptop, and we had it as a progressive web app also running uh, on the phone. So it allows us, like I said, to do write once, run anywhere. Um, and you can implementing, implement this using uh, several well-known frameworks, right? So um, you can use CSS media queries to detect the size of the screen. Um, there are several frameworks out there that can do that. Um, frameworks provide grid layouts that allows you to dynamically rearrange content on, on the screen. And if you need to, you can use uh, more advanced techniques like uh, resize observers um, to get more granular control for what is happening in the application. We also make our app progressive. There are several benefits to using a progressive web app. Um, it helps us solve the mobility challenge. So pro progressive web apps are network agnostic. They run online or offline. They also allow you to do a write once, run anywhere. They're always up to date. You don't need to download a new version from the App Store. They're secure. They need to be run on HTTPS. And they are shareable. You can simply share a link and use the application. The other thing that we want to do is make sure that our application is always available. And it's really easy to do this with AWS AppSync SDK. It's actually configured by default. Um, like you saw, we used to rehydrate a component to rehydrate our information from storage into our cache. We can also use the fetch policy to define how queries need to interact with the cache and with the backend. We can specify things like cache and network, cache then network, or no cache, or network only to specify how we should query. The AWS AppSync SDK also maintains an outbox of messages. Um, this is pretty useful because when you go offline, all of your mutations are stored in this outbox. And when you come back online, the mutations are re-executed. And if you've ever used the AppSync SDK, you can actually use Redux tools to see the state of your outbox. So that's pretty cool as well. Now, offline data rendering, um, we want to make sure that we provide the right type of experience for our customers. So it's, it's good to know that we can handle things offline, but we need to provide an experience that actually matches, uh, matches that and uses the offline uh, rendering properly. So to do this, we use optimistic responses. In a nutshell, optimistic responses provide our applications with what we expect our responses from the back end to be. So if we are offline, we can create a mutation that then tells our application what the response expected is. And before we get that response from the back end, we can actually display this on our um, client. So this is how we were able to show that message that we had sent while we were offline and um, make sure that the user knows that this, the mutation request has been stored and that we have it, the message. So we've gone through how to address some of the basics, right? But we didn't really address the final challenge, which is the differentiation, differentiation challenge. And I'll add, add, let Ed talk a bit more about that. Before I start, uh, just a little background about myself. As I mentioned, um, I'm Brazilian. So I moved to, I spent most of my adult life in Australia. Uh, as a Portuguese speaking person, you are uh, raised and, and taught since a young age to enunciate and pronounce words very clearly. Uh, if you ever go to Australia, you notice that's not the preferred way to communicate over there. So for instance, uh, they don't say afternoon. Australians say arvo. They don't say, oh, I'm going to a service station. They say, I'm going to the servo. It took me a while, a couple of uh, days, to realize that Barbie is something that you eat and not a toy for young kids. Uh, one of the main capitals is called Brisbane, actually breezy. And I suspect they named the biggest city in Australia Sydney because they wanted something pre-abbreviated. 
Australia is a great place, so if you have the chance, uh, it's definitely uh, worth uh, to visit. Just a very long flight, but uh, totally worth it. I love that country. Uh, but these are just examples on how language has these idiosyncrasies depending on the location. If you have a global audience, maybe uh, users that speak Portuguese, speak French or Australian English, right? So wouldn't it be great to add capabilities such as translation or sentiment analysis for your application so you can basically get that sort of capability and insights of your users? And that's, in my, that's my opinion, one of the biggest advantages of boosting your application with artificial intelligence, improving the user experience. But how can I do that without a PhD in data sciences or med skills with deep learning frameworks? Amazon has been investing in machine learning for over 20 years. And you can see it in action on Amazon.com uh, recommendations engine, uh, the Amazon uh, Echo with Alexa, or the groceries experience of the future with Amazon Go, where, where you don't have lines of checkout. If you are uh, very experienced with deep learning uh, frameworks, we support all the major deep learning frameworks uh, uh, out there. And you can basically spin up EC2 instances based on our deep learning AMIs and run and train and develop your models. We also provide uh, platform services such as Amazon SageMaker, uh, that allows you to build, deploy, tune, and, uh, and, uh, and train your models very easily and provides uh, managed uh, Jupyter notebooks and endpoints for that. And the industry is actually, uh, th these are skills that are high on demand in the industry, and they are actually looking for that unicorn that's very good with data science, but also very good with software developer, de development. Uh, what about you, you like myself, your developer that doesn't have much experience with uh, deep learning frameworks or machine learning models? Wouldn't it be great if you could just make API calls and access pre-trained models to give me those insights instead of trying to develop and train those models myself, reinventing the wheel? And this is exactly what our application services, AI ML application services provide. They uh, provide insights in different areas, such as computer vision with uh, recognition image and video, uh, speech recognition with uh, uh, text-to-speech and speech-to-text with poly and transcribe, language insights with translate and comprehend, and conversational chatbots with, with Lex. So in our application, you're using five of those services. You're using uh, recognition, to detect, uh, to perform object and scene detection, as well as a celebrity recognition. Polly is the voice of your application, so it speaks messages and also, uh, and also it speaks translated messages. Messages are translated with uh, Amazon Translate, and we can perform sentiment analysis and entity detection with Comprehend. Finally, we have chatbot with, uh, with Flex, conversational chatbot with Flex. So as I mentioned before, language is very important. That's how we communicate to each other. So how can we add specific insights related to language in our application? And as you can see, there are lots of use cases. Let's take a closer look at, uh, at those five services that you're using. So of course, we have Amazon Translate that allows us to perform real-time translation. You can also send batch uh, documents to translate for batch, batch translation. Poly help us turn text into lifelike speech, so supports different voices and languages with correct, correct intonations and accents and pronunciations. Comprehend is a natural language processing service that allows us to extract insights from text. Comprehend has also a very interesting capability. You can send a library, a batch of hundreds or thousands of documents to Comprehend, and it can perform what they call topic modeling. So it can organize your, your, your data in different topics. So that's very interesting for, again, large library of texts, of documents. So it can send any type of text to Comprehend, uh, social media, uh, articles, uh, 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 papers, or anything that you need. And Comprehend organize the, the text and the data in, in four categories. Entities, there are actually basically 
people and quantities and, uh, and locations. Key phrases on the text, the language the text is written on, so it, it detects multiple languages, and also perform sentiment analysis depending on the context of the text. And also, it can do that in multiple languages as well. This is a very uh, simple example. You can send any text you comprehend, and you can detect and get insights in those four different areas. Amazon Lex uh, basically uses the same technology as the, the uh, Alexa on the Amazon Echo. It performs a natural language understanding and automatic, automatic speech recognition to provide conversational interfaces and integrate conversational interfaces in, in your application. Last but not least, we have Amazon Recognition. It has very interesting capabilities such as object and scene detection, celebrity recognition, facial analysis, facial detection. Also, you can detect text from the image and uh, unsafe image detection as well. So if you have any inappropriate images, uh, recognition can detect that. But how can we actually bridge those capabilities? Because Brees mentioned lots of very interesting libraries and tools and services that allows us to get up and running really quickly, uh, allows, allowing us to focus on development. We also just saw a couple of services. So how can we basically get to the topic of the session, bridge the access to those services and those other uh, capabilities such as real-time and offline? Well, that's very simple. We use AWS AppSync as a layer that translates and do the bridge between uh, those capabilities. So now, uh, this is all our, on our chat demo. This is our app, and we're gonna focus on our intelligence backend. So how can I access those features using GraphQL? Before we start, let's understand how data flow works on AWS AppSync. So when a client connects to uh, AppSync GraphQL API, we can intercept that request using request mapping templates. They're basically using VTL or velocity templates, basically transforming or enhancing that request before it reaches a data source. The data source is going to send the response to the request. We can also intercept that response and transform it before it reaches the client. And here we have one of our front end AI components. That's our client code there. Uh, do you notice anything different? If you know a little bit of React? Well, there's nothing special about that. There's no inference code, there's no machine learning uh, models, there's no frameworks. It's, very, it's a simple React code. So I'm basically just importing a GraphQL query. I'm using that query to feed my high-order component, and then I'm just making a GraphQL call to my API. In that case, I'm sending a request to recognition. Recognition will send a response. Again, this is the client code, but how does it work in the back end? Let's dive a little bit deeper. So how am I interacting with chatbots using GraphQL, for instance? So it, it always starts with a GraphQL query. So I have a very simple query that's called invokeBot, and my query needs two pieces of information, a chatbot name and a text. A text is basically the message. is a sentence that's gonna trigger my chatbot or is going to respond to a chatbot question. I send that query to my GraphQL API on AppSync, and I have a resolver that's basically linked to that invoke bot query, and I can use mapping templates on that, on that request. So here I'm adding uh, uh, some extra data to my, to my request. I have a field that I'm calling lax, I'm also capturing the data that my client is sending, and I'm adding an extra uh, field there. As you can see, the sender. So the sender is capturing a, a user ID from my JWT token provided by Cognito. And AppSync does all of that in the back end for me. I'm using an invoke operation, so I'm just in invoking a Lambda function. My Lambda function basically has a, a switch statement that detects my lax field and it retrieves the data that's being sent by my resolver, the bot name, the, the user ID, and uh, the input text. I use that data to invoke the post text API, which is, if you're using JavaScript SDK, is a normal API call, a single API call that you can make to Lex. Lex is going to send a response, and 
send that, that response back to the client. How it works on Lex itself. So this is a Lex console. Uh, I have here my movie bot, chatbot, uh, one of the, the parameters that I need to send. And here I have specific sentences that are called utterances. So there are special sentences that Lex is able to detect. And those utterances, they have what they call slots. Slots, as you can see here uh, on our, for instance, name slot, they have special meaning. Inside those sentences, I can detect, uh, for instance, the, the name of a movie. I know that name is related to a movie. I then send that data to a Lambda function. But you can think of that as the brains of my chatbot. And in that case, it sends a response. I'm just uh, 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 calling the MovieDB API to get data about the movie. But how am I using taking advantage of AppSync real-time capabilities with my chatbots? So we just saw this whole workflow from the client all the way to Lex and how Lex sent a response back to the client. But that, that's only part of the job. That's not good enough. Because only the, the user that sent that request is going to receive the response. This is a multi-user collaborative application. It's a chat application. I want all the users in my chat application to receive my chatbot responses. So uh, GraphQL has three types of operations, queries to read data, mutation to write data, and subscriptions. They're linked to mutations and perform real-time notifications, as Brice mentioned before. And that's what I need to do. I need to send a mutation. So in that case, I'm getting the response from Lex and send to DynamoDB through a mutation. That allows two very important capabilities. First of all, I'm saving a history of my chatbot interactions to Dynamo. And that can be available offline, of course, when, when I'm uh, accessing from my uh, application. But most importantly, I can link a subscription to that mutation. And in that way, I can broadcast my chatbot responses in real time to the client. So as you saw in our demo, so I can basically invoke my bot and the other client, the other user on a different device can access that in real time. Another very interesting capability, how can you use those services in conjunction? So here we have three services. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have uh, Comprehend detecting uh, the language and using that for two things, for, to translate the text and also to speak the translated text as well. So in order to translate text with, uh, with translate, I need three pieces of information. Uh, source language, a destination language, and the text. So since I'm using uh, Comprehend to detect the language, the source language, and I have the text from the message, I just need one extra piece of information, just a destination language. So my user just needs to select that one piece of information. So less clicks and less interactions in my UI, so better user experience. In the same sense, uh, in order to speak the text, I need two pieces of information to send to Polly. The text itself and a voice. Voices in Polly are linked to uh, languages. So for instance, Ziyu speaks Mandarin Chinese, uh, Mathieu speaks French, Russell speaks Australian English. So if I send French text to Russell, it's going to speak with an Australian English accent and it's going to sound horrible. So by using uh, comprehension to detect the language, I can basically take advantage of that to basically send the correct voice to Polly. Another very interesting capability of Comprehend is uh, sentiment and entity analysis. So for instance, you can see here I'm detecting Las Vegas and MGM as uh, locations and reinvent as an event. Just trying to make more fun as well, make it more fun as well and, uh, and use uh, a smiley face, a smile if the text is a positive text and a sad face if it's, if it's a, a negative text. We also found out that Comprehend can detect sentiment and emojis. How cool is that? What about offline? We talked about real time, what about offline? When you're offline, you're at reduced capacity. And if you're using machine learning or artificial intelligence with offline capabilities, you need to basically run your model in the client through inference. So how can I take advantage of some specific offline capabilities without running models in my client? As you can see, out of the box, 
AppSync provides those capabilities. And as you saw in our demo, I could get uh, data from, uh, from my image recognition, data from my translation and sentiment analysis while I was, while I was offline. With my chatbots, basically, since I'm saving the chatbot responses to Dynamo, I have access to a history of my chatbot responses uh, uh, when I'm offline. The only service you, not, you don't have any offline capability is Poly, but basically because in our particular implementation, we are playing the audio messages directly from S3. So since we talk about media, images, and audio, so how are we uh, actually uh, uh, providing media intelligence to our application? So we're saving our image files and our audio files on S3 in a private bucket, so only users in my application have access to that bucket. My AppSync API is also private, so only users authenticated and authorized can, can actually access and send messages. Those messages are stored on DynamoDB. AppSync uh, uh, allows for, uh, has support for complex objects, which means it can model images and audio and files as GraphQL types. Uh, and that basically happens, uh, you, you just create a pointer on DynamoDB to those files on S3. Lambda is providing the bridge between our AppSync GraphQL API and our AI services, just making three different API calls to, to uh, uh, recognition, to recognize celebrities and de detect objects and scenes, and synthesize speech to actually generate the audio assets from Poly. If I need to actually rec recognize uh, uh, objects and scenes and celebrities and images, I just need two pieces of information. I just need to send the bucket name and where in the bucket my image is to recognition. Recognition has permissions to access the bucket and it can perform that uh, an analysis uh, directly from S3. With Poly, I, uh, the, the synthesized speech needs to be done on demand. So as we discussed before, uh, I, can just, I just need to send the text and the voice. The voice is detected using a comprehend Poly uh, uh, basically sends a data stream back to Lambda, and Lambda saves that data stream in an MP3 format to the S3 bucket. It also retrieves a, a signed URL from S3 to the specific audio file and sends to, uh, to the client. So everything is very secure, only clients in a specific chat conversation have access to those assets. So we talked about uh, challenges in modern applications. Now let's uh, let's uh, let's see if we can actually if we actually manage to address those challenges. So the modern web, mobile and web apps they must address the security challenge. And the, and as you saw before, with apps in, uh, with uh, with AWS Amplify and Amazon Cognito. We can create a front end and a back end, a very powerful, serverless, scalable identity back end in minutes. The data challenge. GraphQL allows us to perform optimized network calls and retrieve only the data that we need. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no overfetching and no underfetching. And by using AppSync, a fully man managed GraphQL service, it makes it even easier. AppSync provides very important offline capabilities. PWAs provide very offline, uh, important offline capabilities uh, with regards to the UI. And because I'm using PWAs, I basically have a single code base and I can uh, uh, access my application from different devices and different screens. The differentiators, differentiation challenge. Providing a great user experience with real-time offline capabilities and as well uh, very important intelligent features to my users. Also a great developer experience with our tool chain and the uh, AppSync console. You can run and prototype call, uh, your GraphQL calls straight from the console. So basically I'm adding intelligence and very important features that differentiate my app using GraphQL as a point of entry for my application. And most important, I didn't have to install, operate, patch, maintain, or troubleshoot any servers. 
that allow me to move faster and, and create my app even faster. So again, uh, this is our application. It's public, it's available on GitHub, so you can basically spin up and, and deploy on your own AWS account. So go build and have some fun with uh, GraphQL and our AI application services. Thank you very much.